Everyone, welcome to another edition of Founder Wisdom Podcast. Today we have Jenna, Jay Tenenbaum with us. I have a problem saying that name, but uh, here we go. I did it. Jay is co-founder of Scottsdale Real Estate Investment and a serial entrepreneur, done a lot of things, very successful. Jay, welcome. Can you introduce yourself and your companies? Yes. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm a co-founder of, of Scottsdale REI. Um, we uh, are a private equity hedge fund buying primarily distressed mortgages nationwide. Um, I've been in that space for about almost 10 years now. Um, and I was a debt collection attorney before that. So I basically, you know, been in debt all my life, just not personally. Interesting. Uh, cool. Well, I mean, yeah, you've done lots of things. Um, tell us a bit more about uh, that business because to me, Jay, you look uh, really successful, uh, wealthy uh, for sure. So like I, my first question is, where did you get started in terms of entrepreneurship? Good question. So growing up, my my mother owned a catering service for, for 50 plus years. My dad owned restaurants. Yeah. But at home, I got to tell you that it was not about, you know, you, you know, we we're going to raise our, raise our children to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. It turned out that most of us, actually all of us are. I have two brothers and a sister. Yeah. Um, we just learned, we just knew that you know, my mom started a catering service out of the basement of our house in Colorado, and it grew to a multi-million dollar business oh. with a whole fleet of trucks and, a, you know, owning in their own building and all that. Nice. Um, my dad owned restaurants, so we didn't know. So nine to five just wasn't in our DNA. Um, uh, but having said that, um, I grew up in the restaurant business and went to school, you know, business management and such, and thought I would just stay in the restaurant business. I mean, I was a, a busboy, waiter, bartender, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, at about by the time where I was starting to, to get into management, I was, I, I, the curse was, I was getting interviews as a 21, 22 year old kid, getting interviews with restaurants that my dad knew guys. It wasn't just nepotism, it was like, you know, I earned my way. I mean, I had a yeah. sense of career um, by the end of this time, but um, the 28 year old manager was like, was intimidating. So basically it was, the report was like, this isn't gonna work out, right? And I got mm -hmm. kind of disenchanted. So one night, I'm having dinner with my father, uh, which was a rare occasion, just him and I having dinner, you know, with, not at his restaurant or anything like that. <laughs> and um, he goes, get out of this business, go get a profession. Okay. I'm like, well, medicine doesn't excite me, but law does. So I basically, you know, quit my bartending job at the time, mm -hmm. uh, went back to school for a year because I wanted to go, I was, I was on a mission. I'm gonna finish yeah. my last year of undergrad and get into law school the following fall. I knew if I didn't okay. make that happen, I never would. Mm -hmm. um, went to law school, got employed, you know, got a job, uh, the firm that I, that I, you know, uh, worked for, I, I started, there was a law clerk, my second year of law school, i um, got accepted, you know, got an offer to, to, to work there. Once I got out of law school, stayed there for about two, three years, met my wife there, um, <laughs> and realized that, you know, the dream of, of the, of the corporate la you know, the corporate partnership ladder in this law firm, I had a really the partner that I worked for. Um, was like the lower, like the junior's partner in the firm okay. and all the fighting and battling and infighting that they had, they kept telling me about I'm like, you, this is what you want to, this is what I want to aspire to. Mm. And, um, by accident, um, my wife and I decided to start our own law practice in okay. uh, November of 1990. Wow. So you know, I turned, I, you know, looked in the mirror and all of a sudden one day I'm like, wait a second, not only am I, you know, practicing law, which I never thought I would but I'm running my own law firm. So now I guess I am an entrepreneur. <laughs> okay. Um, my brother is a, one of my brothers, is a major car dealer in California. Owns a, he, he sold most of them he, at one point, you know, 19 dealerships. Um, okay. My brother, my brother owns my mom's catering service plus a wholesale spice company. Okay. And my sister um, was uh, in, in public radio um, nonprofits for okay. forever. Okay. So like I said, we, at home, the dinner table, if there was a dinner table, was not about how you're all going to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, that seems to be in your DNA. On my side, my dad was an entrepreneur too. Um, I certainly remember that I went into sales just from listening to him talking on the phone that really much influenced my subconscious when I was younger. Although we didn't talk uh, that much about entrepreneurship at the dinner table and, and younger, well, not younger, but smaller family than, than yours. So that's super interesting. How was the lawyer life? Uh, even when you had your firm, um, was it um, hard fulfilling? Because I mean, you're, you were collecting debt. Is that what you told me? Correct. 
Okay, so how how was that? Uh, was that fulfilling or like did you do well on that level? Did you sold the business eventually? What happened? Yeah, so um, basically it was good for a while, and then and then and then it was and then, and then it was not. Okay, I mean I, I, let, 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 I'll tell you a, a funny story. So if I'm if you're a business owner, any industry doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. And you're starting out, you want to find your first employee and you're scouring all the resumes and whatever you can you know to get that that one star and then you're up to five employees you probably have three stars then you get up to 10 employees and you probably have seven stars you have to 45 employees and you have seven stars what happened right? they just they just you know the work the, the for, when we got when we grew to 45 employees the, the practice just did me in i was playing more babysitting than practicing mm. law and i hated every minute of it and in okay. 2008 that's when my wife and I decided to, to get out and we hey. did. And I became a real estate investor probably around 2009. Yeah, and that coincided uh, with the crisis. So the real estate prices were low. Um, you were probably cash rich from uh, cashing out of that business and you decided to invest in the underpriced real estate assets. Is that right? Actually, not really. So what happened was in 2009, um, when, we, when we got out of our law practice, we decided we still wanted to practice law, but we just didn't want to do it on our, we wanted to do it on our terms. So we were basically contract attorneys doing post being this the, the you know the crisis doing post foreclosure eviction trials. Okay. So we were tethered to going to court every day for somebody, but it was really no clients, no office, no overhead. And we were getting paid well just to show up in court, do our trials, come back home, report on them, throw the files away, and, and move on to the next get ready for the next day. Okay. Um, one of those appearances that I made, I connected with a guy, long story short, we, I started up in 2009, um, another company, um, we were buying judgment liens in California okay. Okay. and with a debt collection background, I was tired of garnishing people's wages or hitting their bank accounts. So we developed a model where we were taking, we were buying judgment liens, you know, we, sellers were selling us their judgments. They got like 2001, never collected on them. So we were renewing them. And then executing on real property and okay. came up with a really you know a sound model to do that um that worked really well for about three years and then as the market got better the our sellers who was get, who were getting ready to, so you know everything works out silically right so in that, that 2009 and 12 time period our sellers were getting rid of their judgments to then turn around and reinvest their capital into fresh paper because that's what they were doing right Okay. Um, or they're suing people, you know, uh, credit card debt, et cetera, suing people for that. Yeah. Um, by 2012, as the market got better, and they're starting to get, you know, people refinancing their houses again, and they're starting to get paid off of their expired, old judgments, they decided our, our seller relationship started not to sell anymore. Okay. So it kind of dried up. At that point, I went to a no buying for dummies workshop in August of 2013 in San Diego um, okay. and got into the distressed mortgage business ever since. Hey, and... Uh, what are judgment liens? Can you explain? Because a bunch of what you said was jargon to me. Sure. So basically you have a credit card yep. and you, in that time period, you know, 2000, whatever it is, you stop paying on that credit card yep. and the credit card company hires their collection attorney who then sues you. Yep. They got a judgment against you, but for whatever reason, they were, they were never able to collect it on it. Okay. So what we were doing in 2009 and 2012 is, we were buying, and basically what, what, they, what the attorneys did was, even though I couldn't collect against you, I still filed a, a, an abstract of judgment, okay. which meant that if you ever owned property, the judgment would attach to your property. Okay. Hmm. And so all we were doing was executing on the real property as the asset. I didn't okay. care wh which, whether I was gonna garnish your wages or hit your bank account, I didn't care. Okay, so basically let's say that I buy this property, as soon as I do, um, there's someone reclaiming money at this address. Is that what it is? No, there's a, there's a lien. There, there, there would become a lien on the, on your property. Okay. And with the exception of what we were doing, that lien would get paid off at any point in time that you refinanced or sold the property. Got it. Okay. Got what it, we got were, it. what we were doing is we were forcing the issue. We developed a, a model, you know, we used, we used, you know, just in case law in California and we basically were doing four sheriff sales. Got it. And when you got tired of that uh, slash when you got um, 
informed slash educated enough on the market, on the real estate market, you decide to actually get into it probably by a couple of properties, right? Um, no, I mean, when I got in 2013, so what I learned more from 2009 to 2012 was more about real estate. I mean, really the only real estate experience I had up till then was just the homes that I owned for myself, right? Yeah. Um, but I did learn in the judgment lien side, you know, I had to, I had to examine title. I had to make sure, you know, what position our judgment lien was in and, and, and all that. So I got, mm -hmm. I got to, I got educated on that. And then when I got exposed to the opportunity to buy distressed mortgages, I jumped on it. Okay. And when you're buying distressed mortgages, I'm not buying the property. I'm buying paper. Okay. I'm buying your, you know, you take now, now, now let's turn the situation in. You go to buy a house. Yep. Take out a mortgage, you get a the bank has a security interest, deed of trust, or mortgage on the property, mm -hmm. right? And if you default on that, yes, the bank may foreclose on you, but for the most part, if there's a second, there's a huge secondary market where we're buying your defaulted mortgage. Then okay. I'm calling you up to say, hey, you know, let's do a loan mine or let's keep you in your house. Okay. That kind of thing. Okay. And when you tell me to go pound sand, I'm gonna foreclose on you. Okay. All right. And so how many clients did you got from that side of the business? Because I mean, it's, it's somewhat huge loans. Well, um, it's, it's negative cash flow. You need to pay it, um, on a monthly basis, some loans that weren't paid, uh, but obviously you charge some interest on that. So can you tell us a bit more about that business and how many clients you had? Yeah. So when we're buying a distressed mortgage, we're buying, like for the for example, um, you take, you get, a, you buy a mortgage, you, you take out a mortgage to J, through JP Morgan Chase. Yeah. When JP Morgan Chase sells that, they sell that asset, they sell that mortgage, default the mortgage in a pool yeah. to Goldman Sachs. Yeah. And then Goldman Sachs sells it for another dollar ninety five to some other hedge fund. And yeah. then we're yeah. buying it from that hedge fund at a okay. deep discount. Yeah. So basically now I own, I own your mortgage. Yep. Right. So you're, you're, you're either paying on the mortgage or I'm getting you to pay on the mortgage or you're not paying on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. I'm not assuming any obligation on the mortgage. I am the owner of that mortgage. Okay. And so, if, you know, regarding clients, it's a matter of, of, I've done probably over 500, bought, bought, bought and sold over 500 distressed mortgages in my, in my career. Okay. Let's say that you take over my mortgage. What kind of interest rates uh, can I expect? Is it 15% or is it lower than that? That's no, probably basically, way lower. Bas basically, so you, you're, you're right. So at the time that I buy your loan, if I come to you to, act, to you know to discuss whether you want to modify it, I'm going to modify. It. I'm going to change for the better for you okay. the interest rate for well maybe maybe not the interest rate, but change the monthly payment because if, if you're if you're making a $500 a month mortgage payment, you can't make it. I'm, I'd be an idiot to say, hey Charles, I just took over your loan. I still want you to make a $500 payment. You can't make. That's yeah. not going to work. Yeah. So there, in, in that conversation, we'll agree that you that we'll lower your payment. Okay. Um, we'll agree that I'm not gonna re-amortize in the other 20 some years you have on the existing loan. So we'll give you okay. a new 30 year term. Okay. Um, we'll agree that if you're 12, you know, 20 grand behind, you may give me five grand, I may waive the other 15. Or okay. I may put that 15 or 20 on the backside of the loan. Okay. Um, I'll probably change the interest rate a little higher than what you have. Yeah. Only for the, for the concept of, I want to incentivize you instead of paying you know higher interest rates to refinance me at some point okay because i've Got i've it. now changed your defaulted mortgage into a performing mortgage your credit improves yep. and you could get you could you could get it refinance the property take me out okay. now that's conceptual reality is most people you know in having this conversation with you most people um are just comfortable making that that lower payment that we've agreed to yep. and they don't care that they're paying more in interest than they should okay yeah that's that's the truth of it. They they favor the short term over the the long term. That's how most humans think. Um, <clears throat> and let's say that this mortgage, I don't know, it's three hundred k. What type of money can you make off that? You know, are we talking about uh, five percent of three hundred k? I probably would... bought I probably bought your mortgage somewhere around one hundred fifty to one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Okay, wow. Okay, that's back in the day. So that that wasn't expensive so in what area was that all over the country and all we're still doing it our our, our 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 average discount on properties right on, on notes we're buying now is probably around 52 percent okay 52 percent so let's say that it's on 150 bucks like how, how much are you 
making of that? Like, and is it like over a period of time? I want to see it like if it, it all it, it all it, it all depends. So let, let's 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 keep it maybe more simple. You have a mortgage of one hundred grand. Yeah. Uh, let's say I bought it for fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. So on the one hand, I can reinstate you. We can put you on a loan mod, and let's say you're making five hundred dollars month more monthly payments, right? Okay. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting six thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Like holding on, making make you know having having you be one of my performing loans. Yeah. So I'm making six thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Then, and let's say, you know, at a seven, eight percent, nine percent interest rate, yeah, hundred thousand dollars you owe is the principal reduction is not going to come down a whole lot. So let's leave, let's let's take a conversation. Let's leave it a hundred grand, right? Okay. Yeah. In that year, after that one year, I got six thousand dollars in my pocket, mm -hmm. and maybe I got another five grand to you know to, to, to you bought so you bought you know you, you, we waived some of your rearages because you paid, paid me five thousand dollars up front. Sure. Now I got eleven thousand dollars in my pocket. Yeah. Right. And then I go to sell that mortgage to someone. Now you're performing. Now I've taken a, 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 a non-performing loan, turn it performing, create a okay. value add. Okay. Now I sell it on the secondary market for eighty-five thousand dollars. Okay. Because you're so, because you're put, because you're paying on it. So you made like thirty-five k in the process in a very short amount of time. In about in in about a year, if I want to hold out for a year, yeah. Okay. Okay. Huh. That's that's interesting. Um, now now let, let's let's take it one step further. Let's say we don't get you to perform. Yeah. Right. And your house is worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. I foreclose on you. Okay. I go. I property goes to auction. Okay. Some third party investor is going to pay over a hundred thousand dollars for that house. Now I made fifty grand because my loan got paid. My, the loan that I bought got paid off, but I bought it at a discount. Okay. Well, yeah. That's... Third, third, third scenario is I decide you know nobody nobody at the, the auction sells it, right? Or buys it. So now I take the property back. Now okay. I own your house for 50 grand. Okay. And you can rent it or do whatever you want with it. Fix it, flip, do whatever I want with it. Okay, cool. Huh. Interesting. And how does that compare, let's say, with other types of real estate businesses like, um, I don't know, commercial real estate or why is this business more interesting than these other types of real estate businesses? Well, that all, that all depends on, on what your investor ID and your cup of tea is. Okay. I don't know the commercial multifamily space as well as I do the mortgage space and the mortgages that we're buying are secured against single family one to four units. Okay. It's a space that I know. Okay. And I mean, you in that field, you know, the legal side of it. So it's easier for you to, to win and to, to be efficient and to get your cash back, I guess, than a, a normal dude that would want to get in the same business. Um, funny you say that because early in my career, you're right. Um, when, 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 I would, would, I'm able to talk to a borrower and do a loan mod is probably is more effective than most anybody. Well, that my asset managers, I've got really good asset managers as well. Okay. And people used to come to me and say, well, that gives you an advantage, yeah. right? Because of my legal background. Mm -hmm. And basically I said, no, not, that's not necessarily true. That gives me a particular skill set, experience and expertise. Okay. Now, now what I don't have is I'm not the analytical kind. I okay. cannot sit in front of a computer and analyze a spreadsheet for more than five minutes. I get bored, the ADD kicks in, I'm gone. So <laughs> what I tell people is basically, is look, look, I may have that experience and skill set, right? But you, but I have a you who those who have the analytical skill set because I don't. So it's a, it's a trade. So so who takes care of the analytics? Do you have an employee that my, does my, that? My, my partner, my, that's my partner's end of the business. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, we all need that that type of uh, person in the business. I'm the same. I'm the idea guy, the visionary, the salesperson. So yeah, very much ADHD as well. Uh, let's talk about AZP uh, Capital. Um, explain us that that part of the business. That's a, that's a company that I moved out to Arizona and founded with two other partners um, okay. doing the same thing. Okay. I've been, you know, like I said, since 2013, I've been buying distressed mortgages um, with different, through different partnerships over the course, but we've been, I've been with found in Scottsdale, our guy with my current partner for the last, going almost five years now. Okay. And give us an idea of the, the ballpark such a, a business can make for you on a yearly basis. Let's say that if you cash out and the, the valuation of such a a business, I, I just want to see like and compare with me, I'm more into software as a service uh, type of business, um, direct services business, which I use as a lab to test like business ideas and so forth. Um, 
what's what's so attractive about that business? Because let's say 35K on the on a short term per clients, let's say that you run at 100 uh, clients a year. Um, yeah, that's that's like big cash. It's like probably three to uh, 10 million a year. Um, and obviously have great relations with banks. They loan you a lot of money and you can, you can scale your operation that way. Um, what does it look like from a financial perspective? Well, I, I'll tell you that um, in, since 2018, um, when, I, when I founded, co-founded Scottsdale, yeah. we've spent about $13 million on acquisitions. Okay. And we've got over 30, million, over 30 million in assets under management right now. Oh, nice. And that's current. That's current. That's current assets under management. I mean, like I said, we've done four or five hundred deals since two thousand eighteen. That Correct. doesn't. That you know. So we we we've moved a lot of stuff. We got paid off an auction a lot last year and nice. things like that. We've got probably a hundred and little, probably over one hundred and fifty assets uh, currently in our on our in our portfolio. Okay. And is it um, a, does it necessitate a lot of time? This business um, you have to spend lots of time at the office, or is it? Uh, more of the sit back and relax and watch the, the money pour in type of business? <laughs> um, good question. So in the beginning, yes, you can, it's just like any entrepreneur business, you can expand to put your blood, sweat and tears in it, right? Mm -hmm. Now the mm -hmm. big, the, the good piece of this, of this particular business is there's a, a lot of the business that you can outsource immediately. Okay. I outsource my foreclosure to my foreclosure attorneys. I outsource my servicing to my servicer. I outsource my custodian. I outsource my insurance broker. Mm -hmm. um, so you put my insurance on my on my notes and, and properties. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you go, if you if you have the vision to scale, which we yeah. have, we've been blessed with the opportunity to scale. Mm -hmm. um, just in the last year, we're up to 15 employees. Okay. So I have so I have two asset managers underneath me. We've got a full financial team with a CFO, so headed by one our CFO. Um, my partner runs the um, finance, the analyst side. Yeah. He's got his team of asset of analysts that, that manage the um, acquisitions. Mm. Um, we, you know, obviously we've got a marketing a marketing department, um, a custom for client relations person. So you yeah. know, we, we we find you know, as any entrepreneur, you find your needs. How do you service your clients? Our clients are our investors, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, how do you best serve your clients? Um, so, you know, you, you, you add the staffing to meet the demand of, of your business. Okay. It allows me, I wouldn't necessarily say I get to work less. I just get to work more selective on what I want to work on. Got it. What kind of return can I expect if I'm an investor? Is it 5% a year, 10% a year? Um, I would, sh I would show you past deals that past it, past prospectuses, past deals that we worked on. Yeah. Gives you an idea. I mean. You know, historically, we've we're, we've been returning to our investors in double digits, yes. Wow. But I'm not. I, but I, you know, as for specifics, I can sh I can show you past examples. Okay, interesting. What's your current role in the business? What do you do exactly? Um, my role primarily is, is I wear two primary hats. One is the managing my asset managers. Okay. Um, you know, they're they're in charge of disposing and exiting of every asset from. Okay. You know, make, calling you to do a loan mod to, you know, take the property back and, yep. you know, doing the fix, managing the fix and flip, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then capital raising. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're, we're raising capital all the time. To, we, we've got some, some, some debt facilities, yes. So we, 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 you know, it's a typical, when you're in the investment side of things, when you're incorporating debt and equity, your equity returns ratchet up. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a, you know, very good pipeline of, of, of a debt facility that we're, that we're in good relationship with, with them. Mm. Um, and, uh, then we, and we pretty much do our deals in, uh, member managed syndications, basically several investors can join in the same opportunity okay. and get into the equity side of it. Okay. Is, is there like four cohorts a year or is it one cohort a year of investors? We're buying, we're, we're buying monthly and we're okay. filling out the syndications that with every opportunity. Okay. The investors, is it a, a known network slash referrals, or do you do outbound also to get fresh new investors? We've got, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I've got it, you know, I've added my, my investor list is growing and growing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's all, you're, it, you know, we, we, when you talk about capital raising, you know, we always say it, it's like the ocean. It just never really sleeps. It just keeps, keeps rolling, you know, just <laughs> waving going by. I mean, you can't, you can't just say, hey, I'm going to turn the tap on and turn the tap off. I mean, you, you know, that's not, that's not a good approach correct. to it. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Let's talk about your, your network. Um, Eliance, you've met interesting people there. 
Yeah, when I moved when I moved to to Arizona, I sought community. So I got involved in a couple, what a real estate community, an entrepreneurial community, which kind of will fit one fit into the other. Mm. Um, and that's been my. You know, when you move to a new city, when you get involved in a community, community or communities like that, yeah. you know, all of a sudden you've got a nice. You know, it helps your business. Sure, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's helped facilitate growing our business. Absolutely, but also, you know, jumpstarts your social network as well. Yeah, nice makes up nice games of golf. <laughs> sure. Because I I reading like some people in that masterminds. I mean, yeah, <laughs> as where to start? You know, Paul Mitchell. Um, I mean, uh, Mr. Universe, former CEO of Unilever and Nestle companies. Um, Eric Gross, former president of Expedia. These are big names. Yeah, correct. The founder that's of NordFest. That's the entrepreneurial side. Yeah. So do you do you hang out with those folks like uh, often? Is is that? And what what about the mastermind? Like, do you guys meet monthly? How how does it work? Yeah. So we we do meet with our individual masterminds on a monthly basis. We've been my my group has met have met for going on close to three years now. I think. Okay. Um, and we were one of the, we were one of the, the, the inter, the, one of the in, in startup uh, masterminds. Okay. Um, do I hang out with those guys all the time? You know, some of those guys, you know, aren't local to, to, to Arizona. So the answer would be no, but there okay. are events that they, that we put on that, that I will see those guys there. Okay. Um, and I have made, made relations with them. Um, or, you know, it's one of those things where, especially when you're, you know, in a new city, um, I may go to some restaurant or some sporting event or something yeah. and, I, and I run into or a concert and I might run into somebody that that's, you know, from that, from that group. Yeah. Has that helped you like in the, in the business sense of thing? Because yeah, you can meet up people, but has uh, some members become investors? Have you gone into ventures with some of them? Yes, we have. In fact, uh, our software, REI Blade is a, is a joint venture with, with a, a software developer we met at Alliances. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Um, so for all founders out there, I mean, you've, you've made it, um, in, in so many ways, you know, like what would you recommend them if they have not started a business yet and they're thinking to start one, uh, what would be your top advice there? You know, I'm probably a bad person to ask on, of that because I'm a shoot ready aim kind of guy, Okay. <laughs> right? Um, you know, I guess, I guess the question is, is, is if you come across an opportunity that you're passionate and, invest, and invested in, you do what it takes to make it work. Um, it may be by, you know, you yourself and I, chief cook and bottle washer in the beginning, which is how we really started our law practice. Um, but I mean, uh, and from there, you know, it grew. Um, you know, I was a real estate investor. Um, I, I, I personally don't do well, you know, as the lone wolf. Okay. Um, I need, I need the balance of, you know, a partner who's got, you know, not necessarily complementary skill, complementary skills, but not identical skills. Right. Okay. Um, and like I said, my, my partner runs the analytical and acquisition side. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, but if, but in the beginning, you know, you, you might, you might have an idea. I mean, I'm most of, okay, I, you know, even including my wife who's my business partner in the law practice, I've started every venture with a partner. Okay. Just because that's just how, you know, how, my, my nature, that's not everybody's nature, right? Mm -hmm. my, my brother started his wholesale spice company by himself. My okay. mom started a catering service by herself. I mean, you know, so it's not a, a necessary deal. It's just a, 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 what your, what your makeup is. Okay. Um, I would, as a, as a, as a burgeoning entrepreneur, you have got it. You, 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 you can't lose sight of the fact that, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have to you know, watch the clock. I don't be, have to answer to anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, in the, especially in the beginning, it still will feel like the job, the J-O-B that you left. Yeah. Only you own 100% of every revenue. You also have to incur 100% of any loss you incur yep. or expenses that you, that you take on, mm -hmm. which were, you were kind of isolated with in your, in your, in your, in your J-O-B. You just got a paycheck whether you showed up or not. Um, so you, in the beginning, you probably, unless you get really lucky and really fortunate, you're going to spend a lot more blood, sweat, and tears, hours, man hours wise, getting it off the ground than you did as your, as your job as well. So people are are, are like, I, I so hate my job. I so I'm so, you know, stringent. I'm tied down to it. And everything else. Entrepreneurship seems so like the grass is greener, and it mm -hmm. can be. You just got to be care. You just got to be cognizant of what you're stepping into. 
Yeah. You know, I can I can easily say, sure, four years later of Scottsdale, I'm in a great place in my life. Yeah. But you know, you know, four years four years ago, I couldn't say that. <laughs> Yeah, the, the initial struggle. And like you said, if it's your first business, I think uh, while well, going with a co-founder is generally advised, depending on your type of your uh, of personality, if you're like most, uh, try to go com- complementary. And I need to ask you, Jay, um, how how did you make it successful starting a, a business with your wife? Because I mean, I have a wife um, and <laughs> we decided not to start anything on purpose together um, when we started a relationship because yeah, it was, it was too much stress and, you know, I like her in as a person, but like in business, you know, I tend to, to be a bit colder and so forth. So how did you make that successful? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my dad was married to my mom before he passed away in 2009 for well over 50 years. Okay. And he used to always joke about, been married to your mom for blah 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 how many years whatever what year it was mm-hmm. and we've only had two good years and they weren't six they weren't consecutive no what i mean what i you know what looking back so yeah we were in law practice together for 20 years over 20 years um i can't part of it is 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 purposeful amnesia because i can't say it was all peaches and and, and unicorns um purposeful learned, amnesia learned that's we, so good learn from each other are different dynamics. I mean, the, the biggest challenge was um, in retrospect, yeah. purely in retrospect, is with only two partners. If we disagreed on something, there was nobody there to break a tie. And the yeah. two attorney dynamic, maybe maybe other other marital partnerships can work this way, but with a with a with an attorney dynamic, neither one was going to back down and acquiesce to the other. So it was like, Correct. who was going to who was going to who was going to break the tie? Yeah. And what would typically happen was. Um, I did it, you know, if we, t- if we tied, I went and did what I wanted anyway to her chagrin. Um, but, you know, we've been married almost 32 years now. Um, we haven't been in business together since 2008. Um, I got to tell you, we do enjoy having separate business interests from, from since then and from now. I wouldn't do it again. Um, not that it was horrible. It just, it just wasn't, it wasn't 100% healthy. We had a great times. We had an interesting time. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So, you know, it can, it can work. I'm not saying that there's a, there's a, you know, absolute, you know, no, no to do it. Yeah. Um, you just got to understand that what you're, again, what, what are you getting, in, getting yourself into? Correct. That's, that's good. I love the, the advice there. You provided lots of good advice throughout the podcast as well. Thank you so much for that. Where can people find out more about you? Sure. So um, our website, which we're kind of re- re- revamping is scottsdalerei.com. Um, check out our podcast as well. Um, the real estate mastermind. Uh, our www.remastermind.live. Okay. Um, my email, jay at Scottsdale REI. Um, and for, for those who, who will never take me up on it, but I challenge you to do so, my cell number is area code 714-458-6317. Um, one thing I wanted to mention um, yep. um, to your listeners is um, there's a book I would really recommend, and that's Three Feet from Gold, written by Greg Reed. And what Gregory did was basically it was a kind of a uh, segue from uh, Napoleon Hill's, you know, Three Think and Grow Rich. Yep. What Greg did is Greg went out just like Napoleon Hill in the modern day version, went out and interviewed all the successful people. Okay. And you hear their stories, mm. how, you know, uh, Century 21 Realtor or, or, or this guy, you know, the famous brands that you've heard of, right? Yeah. Those founders, day one, day well, year one, weren't loving it life so so well so you see how they started out they overcame their challenges and to be you know you know now is successful but they weren't always that way and mm. you got to be you got to be cognizant of that but again three feet from gold you know is don't give up yeah like i mean you're near the the prize you're near the treasure so very very good book uh, recommendation I'll, I'll have a read to it and i'll probably like if it's if it's anything like uh, napoleon uh, hill's book which got me started 10 years ago um so thank you for for that recommendation jay have a good weekend and uh, yeah we'll uh, we'll probably be in touch in the future for sure thanks thank you so much thanks for having me charles have a good day man